Today, uh, for our Experts in Emotion interview, we have the honor of speaking with Drs. Lita Cosmides and John Tooby together, who will help us answer the question of whether and how emotions are products of our evolutionary history, or are emotions evolutionarily evolved? So Dr. Cosmides and Tooby are well known for their work in pioneering the field of evolutionary psychology. They're both professors of psychology and anthropology at UC Santa Barbara, where they co-direct the Center for Evolutionary Psychology. They began their collaboration 29 years ago at Harvard University as undergraduates and have received since then numerous awards, uh, including the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, the American Association for the Advancement of Science Prize for Behavioral Research, American Psychological Association's Early Career Award, um, the National Science Foundation's Presidential Young Investigator Award, and Guggenheim Fellowships. So I now turn to a very special one-of-a-kind duo, Experts in Emotion interview, together with Dr. Lita Cosmides and Dr. John Tooby. So welcome, Lita and John. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. What I thought I would do um, with you is first ask you each a bit about what first got you interested in studying emotion. Um, I don't know, Lita, if you want to go first. Well, we we started together. I mean, we were trying to we were trying to figure out what it would be to have an evolutionary approach to psychology more generally, and you, you really can't have that without some approach to emotion. And we we talked about it a lot, and we were thinking that. Um, there's a phenomenology of emotion which is so real to all of us, right? But on the other hand, at some point, if you think of the brain as a system that processes information, there needs to be some sort of computational, some sort of information processing level description of what, what an emotion is. Mm -hmm. And what we were thinking is that if you separate those questions, just like in, in vision, um, at first people dealt with the phenomenology of vision and what you know is my experience of yellow like your experience of yellow or and so forth but when people and those are it's, those are important questions but to they start to really make progress when they start to get computational about it and so we wanted to think well what would it be to have a computational approach to emotion with the notion that at some point you'll understand the phenomenology but maybe maybe doing the computational part first would help so uh, what I would say is that it, the thing about evolutionary psychology, which is perhaps not widely appreciated, is mm -hmm. that it's very theoretically principled that uh, as this, the, the evolutionary psychological approach to emotion uh, comes straightforwardly out of, uh, you know, out of an analysis of how a brain, which is, uh, consists of a lot of different problem solving mechanisms, would over evolutionary time confronted again and again with given situations like fighting or having to form a mateship mm -hmm. or dealing mm -hmm. with sexual infidelity or all these different situations if the mind is full of different mechanisms like your smartphone is full of apps okay mm -hmm. each one has a different function yeah. uh, they won't all be turned on uh always uh in all situations right some situations where you are uh, you know there's a predator around uh, more, you have to turn up the vigilance system. You have to increase heart rate because you're going to have to flee if you identify which direction the predator is in, and so on. So it's a, a what emotions are are there are modes of operation or a an orchestration of all the different mechanisms, turning some off, mm -hmm. turning some mm -hmm. into particular situations which are particularly well uh, designed to deal with the challenges of a given situation, um, and so. For example, if somebody is taking your stuff and beating you up, then uh, anger aggression system uh, turns on. You need to defend yourself. You need to uh, uh, perhaps attack the other person. Um, and uh, so that's going to be very different than what you would do if you're dealing with your newborn and trying to make sure that it's going to be fed, right? So mm -hmm. uh, not just the physiology changes. That's just one set of mechanisms, but all sorts of other things uh, in terms of memory is almost every feature, feature of psychology you can name will be tweaked uh, into a mode which is the evolutionary long-term best bet for dealing with that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So I actually wanted to ask you both a bit more about your research here. I mean, you're both well known for pioneering this evolutionary approach to understanding emotion. And you've already alluded a bit to some of the fundamental principles of this approach. But I wondered if you might just say a bit more and 
as well as how do we define what an emotion is according to an evolutionary approach that makes it unique from this perspective? Well, we, we think of it as a, as a superordinate program mm -hmm. that when it kicks in, there have to be situation detectors. Mm -hmm. that, parts of the system that say, am I in this particular situation? So for example- Situation is a recurrent thing. Something that's happened a lot of evolution, mm -hmm. not so, your particular local situation. Mm -hmm. I'm so, being a threat by a predator or somebody's treating me badly or somebody has treated me much better than I ever expected and I'm, I'm grateful and how then do I, how then should I deal with that person? That's what we mean by, by, by situation. It should be trigger a whole, uh, set out a signal, mm -hmm. maybe, Part of that, maybe part of our conscious experience of an emotion is the experience of that signal. I, I don't know. Hmm. Um, but that's well, our hypothesis. That's one hypothesis. But to a lot of different mechanisms it, that are going to, so let's say, let's take the simplest case of um, it's dark, you're alone, and there are creaky noises outside. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know whether somebody is yeah. coming to break into your house or, or not. Lots of things change. Your hearing becomes more acute. You notice sounds that you would never have noticed before. Inferential processes get turned on. So was that a random set of noises or was that footsteps mm -hmm. outside? Mm -hmm. um, you remember, uh, you retrieve from memory as all kinds of information that is relevant to figuring out whether you're under threat or not under threat and what to do. Um, you might have, uh, you know, um, it might change some of your learning settings on learning mechanisms. Lots of things might be changed. So if you, you can think of it as a coordinated, a, a superordinate program that coordinates a lot of subprograms in a way that's particularly efficient for solving that adaptive problem. But it doesn't have to be something as, mm -hmm. as uh, simple as the predator situation. Yeah. It can be, there are a lot of interesting social emotions um, that can be, that have to be there to regulate the kind of complicated social interactions that we have, including cooperative ones. Mm -hmm. Lots of times people focus in an evolutionary point of view on, on um, negative emotions. Um, and those are certainly, those are very important. But ones like gratitude and, and um, you know, gratitude, compassion, uh, and so forth are as important in regulating cooperation, for example, as, as we would argue anger is. Um, Right, so I was going to ask, you know, from your perspective, do you feel like this framework applies to a particular class of emotions or, you know, all emotions broadly? I mean, you're bringing up things as diverse as gratitude, anger, and fear. Yeah. So, um, yes, we think it applies to everything. Uh, <laughs> be as imperialistic as possible. Uh, so if you start out as Darwin did, looking at emotion from the perspective of facial expressions, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's a very good start, but that really limits you because whether or not an emotion will be paired with a facial expression mm -hmm. uh, depends upon, over the evolutionary long term, whether it was good to broadcast your internal state or not, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have just a, 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 a small number of facial expressions of emotion. And we, the, we, I think there's a much larger number of emotions which are not designed to be broadcast and, and therefore didn't evolve this signal that, to, tell you, to tell everyone around you, I'm in this particular state of mind. Okay. Okay. So some of them, some, it, 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 there may be negative aspects to broadcasting them. Other emotions, it may be that there's just no utility to. So for example, wonder. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that certain emotions are there to help organize your adaptations, to calibrate them and, and organize them in certain ways. When you see something, um, certain kinds of beautiful events, uh, like a sunset um, or the stars, um, those may be, part of what those may be is a, a system designed to calibrate mechanisms in your brain. It's very unromantic, but uh, to calibrate mechanisms of, of vision and, and color perception and so forth on evolutionarily recurrent events, things that were reliably present in the ancestral past, it could be used to sort of tune mechanisms, um, to, to tune them in the face of uh, uh, the noise of the world. So, so a, a simple idea about this is that uh, in broadcasting there are test patterns, and the function of the test pattern is to, you already know what the signal should be, mm -hmm. so then you can tweak your equipment until you see the signal you know you should see, okay? Mm -hmm. And for evolutionary time, there have always been stars, okay, and uh, mm -hmm. so uh, the mind knows what they should look like, and therefore, if you don't have anything better or more important to do in your hunter-gatherer sort of sitting around at night, okay, uh, 
it's kind of mildly rewarding to look up at the stars, okay? And, uh, mm-hmm. and then these, these things at infinite optical distance allow the different retinotopic maps to be aligned and, and, and so on. So, it's, so it generally, aesthetics should be things which help the brain organize itself and to pay attention to will help to organize it. And it should be uh, mildly, uh, mildly um, uh, pleasant uh, because mm-hmm. you want to do it. Uh, but you don't, it shouldn't, you know, uh, you shouldn't ignore predators, you shouldn't ignore the hunger cries of your child for it, okay, it should be um, just the right level when you have nothing better to do, right? Um, so, I mean, mm-hmm. when you start thinking about it from an adaptation's perspective, not all emotions are going to be there for the same kind of class of problems. Some might be there for a very, very different reason. And also, some things that we don't think of as emotions might be well thought of as emotions, like... Um, <laughs> When you have, when you, uh, when you get a concussion and you're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Coma. When you're in a coma, thank you. Okay, so this is oh. a, <laughs> emergency, emergency medical care yeah. when there yeah. were no doctors or trauma right. centers. Emergency okay. yeah. ER pleistocene, right? So, <laughs> so, so you shouldn't, because there might be internal injuries and moving around would aggravate them, you should be not moving at all, okay? And you shouldn't be exerting energy or get excited by other events that are happening. So you, the, the shuts down and it's a very organ the coma is very organized, okay? And we just think of it as this bad ramifications of the remainder of people who uh, unfortunately never leave the state because they're so damaged, okay? Right, but right. Uh, but for most people in situations, so, so you're, you're you, you know, basketball hits you in the head and you're knocked out, okay? Um, that's this system. Uh, and that's what, when I was talking earlier about uh, starting with facial expressions of emotions, which is a great mm-hmm, place to start. Mm-hmm. But there are these other things which have nothing to do with uh, signaling to others. And uh, so there's a, a great class of emotion. It seems eccentric to talk about so as an emotion because you don't have a feeling, right? But, but uh, either. So you don't have an expression, you don't have a feeling, but it's, an, it's a mode of operation for the whole system. It's, it's, you can think of it as a super ordered program. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just down a lot of different programs so that all the energy can be put into your immune system and into repair processes. So weirdly, from this perspective of superordinate programs that are coordinating other ones, you could think about coma as an emotion, which is not not intuitive, but... Uh, it's fascinating to think of it that way. Yeah. So how would you classify then those emotions that really do need some sort of external display, you know, to signal something to other people? And what would be those emotions that really don't require that? I know you talked about wonder or what people call awe, this idea of a coma. In, in the case of anger, um, uh, we've been working uh, with with uh, a lot of our collaborators, uh, like Aaron Sell and Daniel Caesar on yeah. the notion that anger is um, triggered by the perception that somebody somebody is putting much too little weight on your welfare. More too, they're not taking your welfare into account to the extent that you think that they should be, given the nature of your relationship, and that that should exactly trigger a whole bargaining. Uh, anger is a bargaining system. Um, mm-hmm where you're, that operates in both cooperative and, and, and aggressive sort of situations, but where you're, if it's a cooperator, you need to communicate to them that you don't like what they did, that it imposed costs on you, that they imposed costs on you for a very little benefit to themselves, mm-hmm. you know, and that that's not okay. And you, you're bargaining basically, it activates all kinds of desires to argue with and talk to the person uh, to argue, to bargain for better treatment in the future. So you, you mm-hmm, have mm-hmm. Uh, so it's basically two ways to bargain, and one way is to say, I'm going to inflict costs on you, okay, and then you'll pay attention to what I want. Or the other way is, in a cooperative relationship, uh, you know, it's it's conceivable, we haven't experienced ourselves, but sometimes husbands and wives fight, <laughs> okay? And it's, never, it's, never. It doesn't mean you're going to shoot each other or knife each other, it's that you're in a cooperative, <laughs> a cooperative relationship. So yeah. what bargaining power uh, so bargaining power in uh, non-cooperative relationships is this ability to harm, and mm-hmm, so the mm-hmm. the person who can inflict more harm, who's stronger, and so on, they have more leverage. Leverage, okay. Uh, but in cooperative relationships where you are coordinating your behavior to achieve uh, great mutual outcomes, okay, one uh, the bargaining power people have is the extent they can confer or withhold benefits, okay. Mm-hmm. And so what that what in anger in cooperative relationships. It has the same logic as in the thing, except what you're doing is, you know, when uh, 
somebody's mm -hmm. spouse, all of a sudden their face becomes chilly and so on. That's the external signal of, mm -hmm. uh, or even beyond that, okay. Mm -hmm. but that's the external signal that, uh, from them broadcasting that they think you haven't put enough weight on their welfare and therefore they're going to downregulate the amount of weight they put on your welfare. Or that there better be a good reason why they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 it hopefully it was for a very large benefit to the other person if they were if they were doing something that was harming you or not taking your welfare into account. So that needs to be communicated. If it's not communicated, the whole point of that adaptation it can't the, the function can't be fulfilled unless there's some sort of uh, broadcasting. And it may be also often what dissipates anger is information that where that's conveyed where you realize oh the person did not it's not that they put too little weight on my welfare it's that I misunderstood the situation. They didn't know they were putting a cost on me, or they didn't do it on purpose, or they did it for a very large benefit to themselves, not for something trivial. Mm -hmm. And then that, that just, it just sort of, the ant goes, whoosh, it disappears at, at that point. But, but the sort of, the system of putting weight on each other's welfare, okay, and that those being tied together, so, mm -hmm. uh, um, that when that, uh, it, it's, a, it's a delicate interplay, and, uh, so it's essential. So so anger, which seems like a hostile, bad thing, uh, and uh, you know, it seems to be connected to violence, which would be the harm bargaining. Okay, uh, actually, it's also essential to cooperation because people make mistakes. Information processing makes mistakes. There's always errors. Okay, and so uh, it, it's uh, necessary to communicate your values where things are happening that are not. Uh, what you expected and relied on. Okay, and so then, then you then in fights, people are. It turns out our our, our colleague Aaron Self with this theory has uh, looked at arguments, and the argument structure are things like, uh, you know, uh, you hurt me uh, a great deal, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't intend to, or you don't understand. Uh, I didn't realize that was important to you, or alternatively. You don't understand the full importance to me of having to do this other thing. So it's always about the relative costs and benefits and knowledge states. In these arguments are very highly organized. A, you can think of it as there being a grammar to anger. It, it has a grammar to it. And that people, when they're arguing and negotiating, they, they use that grammar, both in arguing with the person that, that they think harmed them and with the person responding to them. But the, the nature of these evolved mechanisms are their second nature, or their First nature to us, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so we're not necessarily aware of their logic. Okay, so mm -hmm. you can do this highly organized thing in a fight with your spouse and, and not know, and not know mm -hmm. anything about the logic of it. Okay, you feel it; it's guiding you in certain ways. It brings up certain concepts. Um, you remember all the times they didn't put weight on your welfare in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, it's part of or, the pattern. Or they might remind <laughs> the times they really, really helped. That's you out, right. right. Okay. So. so I had a question for both of you too, which is what are the questions right now that you're grappling with and most excited about in this domain of, you know, emotion and taking an evolutionary approach to studying it? Well, uh, many of the things we've been talking about, yeah. yes, but um, the more, from a more general perspective, this whole idea of bringing the emotions into the cognitive sciences and, and trying to get serious about the computational architecture of, of emotions. So that, mm -hmm. that the topic of emotions is as normal a part of the cognitive sciences as a study of memory or the study of attention is. Because I, I, from our point of view, you can't pull these things apart. They are all intertwined. They're, they're all, they're mm -hmm. not only intertwined, but there is a computational count of emotion. And you won't fully understand emotion without understanding that in the same way that you would not fully understand vision if you were only dealing with phenomenology and you were not dealing with the computations that allow people to recognize objects and know where they are. If you didn't know those computations, you wouldn't really understand vision totally. So, so to make that concrete, uh, we, we think there are certain things we call internal regulatory variables, like mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm the weight, so implicitly my brain is calculating uh, what's the weight of this other person that they're putting on my welfare? Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when it's too low, that then the brain triggers puts you into the anger. Uh, anger turns on, and it's a bargaining uh, emotion that's designed to raise the other person's uh, welfare trade off towards you. Or if that doesn't happen, to lower yours towards them, so you're not wasting resources on 
or energy on somebody who doesn't care about you. Okay. Uh, then there's but the same underlying variable, welfare trade-off ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, also in guilt, for example, that would be when you didn't you uh, something you conduct yourself in a certain way towards somebody, and it turns out that was really much worse for them than you expected. And then you need to recalibrate uh, how much weight you put on your welfare because you were putting too little. You were putting too little. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, well, gratitude, gratitude is where you find somebody else is, put, is putting a larger weight on your welfare than you expected and anticipated. And therefore, you need to reciprocate, turn up your WTR, your welfare trade-off mm -hmm. ratio to mm -hmm. them to, to cement this new higher level of cooperation. And so, and so the idea is to map these magnitudes in the mind, mm -hmm. which we, that we can do now, and relate them to the inner logic of emotions, that emotions often play this role in recalibrating uh, your, <clears throat> what you're prepared to do for the other person or your response to the other person. And that's why, that's why we think there's this whole affect complement. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, the phenomenology is there's a sort of broadcasting, which to all the mechanism to say, change your settings on, <clears throat> on this network of variables um, because you have new information about the way the world is. And <clears throat> it takes time to feel, okay? Mm -hmm. So when your mother dies or something like that, People want to go away and be alone and just, and so in a utilitarian, Darwinian utilitarian universe, why engage in such spectacularly non-functional behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, our, uh, our idea about this is this recalibration uh, requires a lot of processing. It takes time to all the ramifications of the fact that you, this person was a center part of your life and now they're gone. Okay. And sure. all the different ways in which that was reflected in your decisions, that now all has to be Reweighted. Maybe you now need new support that you didn't have before, so you feel lonely, or uh, anyway. So, just a question then: When you think about the future of emotion, right, and you have students coming up to you and asking you, "So, what's in store for the future?" And you know, what advice do you have for me? You know, if I'm thinking about embarking in this field, what do you typically tell them? I, I suggest to them that while they, they, if they mm -hmm. use your intuitions. To, as as a as some guide, but really try to take very seriously uh, the kinds of think seriously about the kinds of adaptive problems our ancestors had to uh, solve well in ancestral environments. Mm -hmm. Because if you really start to take those seriously, you realize that they're much more complicated than you would otherwise think, and it can lead you in new directions that nobody would think to look before. So that and and also to actually try to get very specific about what that um, the architecture of those programs is going to be. That's great advice. hope so. Same advice from your end? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. the, it's, as I say, it's, it's very, you can make a surprising amount of sense of the chaos of human behavior if you take this engineering first principles approach of mm -hmm. what are recurring adaptive problems and what would a system that was well designed to deal with those and look like. And then in the modern world, we have often completely different problems. And so the behavior looks non-functional or strange or why, why have that? And, and, uh, but then you can, when you look at the logic, you can make sense that, that organize it again around this engineering principle. It makes enormous sense. And then you can then explore questions of like, well, then what, like, what can we, can we, deal a little bit better with the world if we understand actually the principles that are driving us. Well, and even questions like, are certain things that are considered disorders, are they really disorders mm -hmm. even? Are they the normal functioning of a system that evolved to do, to behave in certain ways, to, to, to create certain kinds of mental states? There are questions like that about grief and about certain kinds of depression. There can be very destructive forms of all of these things. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting question are we seeing an extreme form of something that's really an evolved adaptation, or are we seeing a disorder, a, a true um, dysfunction of an adaptation? And that can be very helpful in thinking about about whether and how to treat. So with depression, for example, you could just see it as a malfunction, um, but it might be that it's a major recalibrational mode, uh, so that you've lived your life in a certain way with certain expectations it would lead somewhere, and then you get this big signal that that's not happening. You invested in a marriage, or you invested in a, you know, you've spent your life trying to get a degree in academia, and then you can't get a job. Uh, okay. <laughs> so all the ways you organize your life on a daily basis and the intermediate values your brain has stored to do certain things, 
you've now got this powerful signal that those were a major set of mistakes. Okay, and so maybe uh, we have no uh, evidence about this, uh, but it's quite possible that interfering with uh, the recalibrational process by drugs or something, you might come out better if you go through a at least a brief stage of doing this processing, um, and uh, rather than to simply think it's unpleasant, we should arrest it. Of course, what I think the major pe the, the, the major depression uh, might be something else entirely, where uh, okay. things that would have brought you out of it ancestrally don't happen. But I'm not saying depression is good necessarily. I'm just saying you want to understand the logic of when things are and doing their evolved functions. Well, I just want to say thanks to both of you for making the time to speak today. It's been such a pleasure and honor to hear you both speak about some of these fundamental principles underlying where our emotions come from and what functions they serve for us. So I want to thank you both for speaking today. Our pleasure, and thanks for having us. Thanks so much thank for having you. us. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Lita Cosmides and Dr. John Tooby from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Thank you both so much again.